Welcome everybody to Holistic Spirituality Interviews. My name is Keshra Madhavadas. Today with me is Prachar Nandadas or Jonathan Banks. Um, Prachar Nandadas is a practitioner of Bhakti Yoga or Krishna Consciousness since more than 25 years. And also he has a PhD um, in natural sciences or is doctor of natural sciences, um, particularly um, um, educated he is in hypergeology mineralogy, I hope I pronounce this all correct, and geochemistry. And he might tell us a bit uh, anyway about his, uh, the details of his career, which is, I guess, quite fascinating also to some because his field is um, something very specific. And the topic we want to cover today is flat earth, or I can call it flat earthism. Um, uh, we know that in the last few years, in the recent years, this discussion has become very prominent in the United States, but also globally, I guess, would be correct to say. There's even a flat earth um, um, society existing. Also on Netflix now, we can see there is a whole documentary about that. So, and also in the movement of Krishna consciousness, this discussion takes more place or it becomes increasingly prominent. Um, having the context of that the Vedic scriptures, like Srimad Bhagavatam and so on, apparently um, confirm such a worldview. Um, many of us, including myself, when I first heard, okay, flat earth discussion, and I was kind of brought back to school when I was just remembering, but wait a second, wasn't that whole thing topic kind of concluded in the 16th century when there were like these, these uh, travelers like uh, Ferdinand Magellan and uh, Francis Drake, who um, circumnavigated the globe. And apparently it's not, it didn't stop there. <laughs> so, and I would like to ask you, uh, Prajananda, what do you think, why is this discussion becoming so prominent or is so prominent also within the spiritual uh, circles or the movement of for Krishna consciousness? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question and thank you for having me this morning uh, where I am, I guess this afternoon, uh, European time. Uh, to the question directly, <clears throat> I think there are two things. Uh, first of all, we see this, uh, this, I, this, what I like to call flat earth hypothesis, because it's mm -hmm. not a theory, it's a hypothesis. Um, there's been a general rise of this in modern society at large, and this is coming into ISKCON uh, from the outside. Um, there is nothing in any Vaishnava scripture that says the earth is flat. Uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam and other Puranas uh, describe the plane of Boom Mandala, and planes are typically represented as two-dimensional flat surfaces Although we see many examples of planes in nature, including the plane of the solar system, which is absolutely not flat. I mean, the solar system is drawn as a plane with the sun at the center and the planets orbiting yeah. around it, but there's still a, a thickness to it. And so Bhumandala does describe a plane, but it is not clear really to any Vaishnavacharya. And this is a topic that now goes back at least a thousand years, uh, probably closer to 1500 years, that this idea of what is Bhumandala and what is the Bhagavatam describing when it describes Bhumandala, this is not something that is settled Siddhanta anywhere in Vaishnav history. And we even find that great Vaishnavacharyas like Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, who got his name Siddhanta mm -hmm. um, for studying these things, he gave up the study of all of this, thinking it um, to be useless uh, in the face of the pursuit of prema bhakti. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just want to, first of all, right off the bat, dispel this misnomer that our scriptures say that the earth is flat. That is just not true. Um, and no Vaishnavacharya has ever claimed that the earth is flat. And we have at the Bhaktivedanta Institute, which is an organization that I work with within ISKCON, 10 pages of quotes from Srila Prabhupada directly and from other Vaishnav scriptures explaining how planets are round balls that are floating in these planes that are described. So um, the idea that the earth is flat is coming into ISKCON from the outside. It's not something that is um, directly in any of our right. scriptures. I challenge anybody to find a statement that says the earth is flat in right. any of scripture. And I think that the reason why this is arising in the general society is due to uh, just bad education. People are scientifically illiterate. 
they don't know basic, they don't know what scientific knowledge is compared to many other types of knowledge. And we also know as devotees, there are other types of knowledge besides scientific knowledge and scientific knowledge. Is, and then they also don't know what scientific knowledge is supposed to be used for. So scientific knowledge, as we know as devotees has limitations, but that doesn't mean it's wrong within the confines of those limitations. It just means it's not useful for, for example, giving up lust, greed, anger, envy, madness, and illusion, and awakening our divine love of the eternal couple, Radha and Krishna. But that doesn't mean that what the scientific method is designed to do and does do is wrong. So on the one side, there is just a general scientific ignorance in the world, and this has to do with like really bad education. And then I think that the Hare Krishna movement in general is like a target for this because we tend to attract anti-establishment, anti-authoritarian people to our movement who want to point to a conspiracy as evidence that we have demonic leaders in society, basically. And so they want to point to a conclusion and then they come up with this evidence to justify themselves. And so there's a rise of this flat eartherism in the society at large, but it infiltrates ISKCON because we, we attract conspiratorially minded people to our movement, right. Right. in my opinion. Okay. Just expressing my opinions here. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, thank you. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there is, uh, in, in the terminology, the Sanskrit terminology seems to be a strong indicator or like uh, at least gives, um, how to say, fuel into the discussion um, when there are the, 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 the terms loka and dvipa. Loka yeah. is usually understood as globe or round, and Dvipa as, is translated as island. And by island, I guess everyone will imagine, of course, it's something flat, maybe it's some shape underneath, but generally flat. So and then this terminology um, seems to be uh, also quite, uh, or plays a big role. Why, why is there description of Dvipa when actually, when it's translated as island, when it actually would mean globe, like we have in the eighth canto of the, of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the story of King Bali, and where yeah. Bali Maharaj conquered all the universes. And then, then there's uh, the English translation, at least, is also like this. He's described as the processor of those particular seven um, islands, or like however was the number, but the, the planetary systems were considered islands, or like Srila Prabhupada uses globe and island synonymously in the purport. So this seems irritating to many. Can you say something on this terminology? Yeah, the, another term that's often used is gola, um, which means ball. Um, so there's bu gola, which is the earth ball. Um, and then there's bu mandala, which is the earth mandala. But what is a mandala? So mm -hmm. um, I, I, I recently gave a, a presentation at the Krishna House here in Gainesville. Um, and this is also something that we worked into um, our science class at the Google School here, the Bhaktivedanta Academy, is what is the difference between a map a meme, a model, and a mandala. These are four different things. So a mandala is an object of meditation. And a mandala is a type of a yantra, which is like a visual mantra. You know, a, 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 a mandala is something that people meditate on in order to enter into a, a sense of transcendence. Um, and there are different mandalas that are geared towards accessing different subtle energies, um, you know, there's Sri Yantras, there are Nishri mm -hmm. Yantras, and these are all types of mandalas. And so the Bhagavatam describes a Bu mandala, which is the earthly, why do we even need to translate the word mandala into whatever? It's the, we know what we know what that means, but what is that? It's like the earthly, it's like the earthly region. Um, I mean, that's where we live. So would you and say then Bu mandala is described concept. as consisting of oceans and islands. Um, but it is not clear, and again, I really, I really state this, not emphatically, but confidently, um, there has been no Vaishnavacharya in the entire history of Vaishnavism that has been able to successfully correlate what we read of as Bhu Mandala in the Bhagavatam to what we observe in the universe around us. Um, so again, this is a discussion that's been going on since um, at least the time of Aryabhata, who is a great uh, Indian mathematician who lived about 1500 years ago. Um, 
and he had disciples in a lineage and many of the things that they were discussing back then are still being discussed today within Brahminical circles in India, as well as in modern secular academic circles. This is an interesting um, humanities discussion, Geistwissenschaft discussion, mm -hmm. a little German here for the pleasure of your audience. Um, so, and then, and so we can fast forward that to the modern times, you know, Jiva Goswami um, was very much in favor of devotees using science and devotional practice, especially as it related to medicine. So there's also no history really in Gaudiya Vaishnavism of people of devotees rejecting the scientific method. Um, we can fast forward a little further. Of course, I already mentioned Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, um, and he gave up the whole, he just gave up the whole pursuit. He said, this is not, this is not going to lead anybody anywhere substantial. Mm -hmm. And then he took a vow to chant a billion names of Krishna. So that for me as a devotee, that is revealing. Um, and then we can fast forward to Srila Prabhupada also. So Srila Prabhupada was not a scientist, not an astronomer. Um, he was a, he was a devotee of Krishna in a, uh, who appeared on this planet as a human being like you and me. Um, and he made many comments about astronomy and the world and governments and all of this stuff. And there's a thread behind these comments. Prabhupada was skeptical of modern scientific versions of things, but he kind of also went back and forth on both sides of many topics. For example, the moon landing, everybody else's favorite, the other favorite conspiracy. The Eskimo. distance of the moon to the earth. The distance of the moon to the earth. Well, we can come back to that one in a second. Um, Prabh the, the, I mean, the, the one thing that, Prabh that Prabhupada himself wrote in the Bhagavatam, that is not a translation or a translation of someone else's commentary, is that the stars we see are reflecting sunlight. They're not giving off their own light. So, but that's also a statement that you can, can find uh, Shastric statements that contradict that concept. So, um, as is often the case with Srila Prabhupada's words, we can find a statement that will support whatever argument we want to. Um, except that Prabhupada never said that the earth was flat. In fact, on the contrary, we have many pages of quotes where he's stating quite clearly the earth is a globe. Um, so I just want to mention, so Srila Prabhupada, when he wrote the fifth canto, and I've heard this from several leading devotees who had a lot of Srila Prabhupada's association during this time, <clears throat> uh, including Hridayananda Ananda Maharaj, including um, the former Hari Kesh Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Prabhupada really gave a lot of very explicit instructions to these two people about the Temple of the Vedic Planetarium and how he wanted the Bhagavatam translated. And I've personally heard from both of these people independently from each other that Srila Prabhupada was not satisfied with his translation of the fifth canto. He asked these people to redo it. And he even sent Hari Kesh all around India looking for astronomers and pundits um, that would be able to help him retranslate it. And that never happened. Um, fast forward just a few years, uh, we had the rise of Sadaputta Prabhu's work. Um, and Sadaputta Prabhu did not try to directly correlate anything in Bhumandala to anything we observe in the universe. Rather, he showed how Bhumandala can be used as a model, not a map, a model. I don't know why this is map and this is model, but that's how it goes. <laughs> yeah. He showed that how Bhumandala can be used as a model that represents several different things at once that we perceive in the universe, depending on how we interpret it. And so the idea that, um, scripture, that scriptures can be interpreted by people like me and you is a relatively new concept in ISKCON. Mm -hmm. uh, traditionally, historically in ISKCON, it's been, this is what the scripture says, this is what it means, and you believe it if you're a Hare Krishna, and if you don't believe it, you're in Maya. Um, and I think that we've seen, really, in the last five to ten years, maybe a little bit more, um, there's been more of a move towards plurality of understanding that I think ISKCON is, is entering into a stage where devotees are more able to be faithful to the organization and to Srila Prabhupada's movement and mission, but also be able to understand the scriptures through the lens of their own relationship with Krishna, if that makes, if that makes sense. So that's Sadaputta. Uh, and so Sadaputta had a very open-minded um, um, vision of these things, you know, and in his work, he also gets into what is the, the length of the yojana, 
You know, we in ISKCON, we typically measure Yojana as eight miles. Um, but the reason why we do that is because that's the number that makes the our version of the Siddhanta line up most accurately with the dimensions of the solar system. And so we can say that these rings and islands of Bumandala, they roughly match up with the orbits of the planets going out to Saturn and the Loka Loka mountain range. And conveniently, of course, Saturn is the last planet we can see with the naked eye. So for me, that raises the question, how did the people that wrote the Bhagavatam knew how far away Saturn was? They had to have had some pretty advanced mathematics and they, and we know they did. Um, so Sadaputta had a more pluralistic view. I think uh, since Sadaputta's departure from this world, other devotees have taken up the, um, the mantle of describing Bhagavat cosmology. Um, and there's been many different interpretations. Um, you know, people have different takes. We just had a conference on this with the Bhaktivedanta Institute where we invited people to come and share with their perspective on what is the meaning of Bhumandala? What are these islands and oceans? Um, should it be taken literally? Um, can it be taken literally? So these are questions that we do wrestle with. But again, I come back to the point that nowhere in any Vaishnava scripture or out of the mouth of any Vaishnava acharya has anybody ever claimed that the earth is flat. All right. Yeah, I think that's a that's a clear point, and I guess this, uh, that speaks for itself in a way. I would say. Yeah, and I mean, I show me the quote. I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying with 100% certainty that I'm right, but I am quite confident. So if anybody out there is listening has some contrary evidence, by all means, let's discuss. Yeah, sure. Everyone who will see that video is invited <laughs> to leave comments and we will uh, certainly respond to that. You mentioned before something um, when you um, uh, talked about Bhakti Sanastara Swati Thako, who ultimately gave up all interest in astronomy, astrology, um, so on, and, and dedicated himself fully to spiritual practice. Um, and the question also that arose from, uh, for myself is what would be the uh, significance, first of all, of this, um, whether the earth is now flat or round um, in, in the overall spiritual life of someone, or even more, what would be the benefit of having a conspiracy going on that um, brainwashes people, okay, the earth is flat, uh, around, but in fact it would be flat. So. I guess one has to think of the benefit also, what would such a conspiracy, um, what, what advantage could someone or some establishment take from that? If I think, for example, of another topic like free will, um, it makes a very significant difference whether one has free will or not. Also, Manuel can't establish without free will, morals would be lost because then um, you could have, you can, can create a culture of um, apologies or you're hiding behind so there would be certainly, there's quite some benefit in having either one version or the other um, for, for practical life or like evolutionary, uh, evolution theory where you, if, an, if a person identifies more as an animal than rather a spiritual being with the human body, which has a kind of a task in this life for higher, a higher purpose, then also makes a big difference because if a person believes, okay, I'm rather just a more sophisticated animal and my, my task is to simply consume and to, to have a materialistic life, then that brings um, quite some benefits in terms of someone could exploit that mentality to make profit from it. But in terms of flat earth, round earth, for me, it won't be clear. What would be the benefit for anyone? <laughs> if it would yeah, be and that's a great question because whenever somebody is, is asserting a conspiracy, and in a real trained investigator, the first question they're going to ask is who benefits, even in a courtroom. I mean, if there's a murder trial, there has to be a motive, right? Um, you know, so who is benefiting? And I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I don't, what's, what difference does it make? And then I, I often have to ask myself, because I spent a lot of time debating with flat earthers for no reason. Like I'm not, I'm not like wondering myself, like, hmm, is the earth actually flat? I'm actually just wondering, can these people come up with any valid argument? Any, and they can't. And it's really entertaining to see how they can't come up with any valid argument. But what's more alarming to me, and one of the reasons why I've recently made this kind of career change from working in a university to teaching in a, in a Google, uh, what is alarming to me is that 
devotees, at least many adult devotees, don't know how to think. Um, they like really don't know how to think for themselves. And we, of course, we know that surrendering to Krishna does not mean surrendering our intelligence. Um, Prabhupada said we wanted to view things from all angles of vision. Um, that necessitates a plurality of opinions that, that demands that people have their own viewpoints on things. Um, you know, and of course we know that doubt is a function of intelligence. So an intelligent person will read the Bhagavatam and read Prabhupada's words and comments on the Bhagavatam and ask questions, challenging questions, not in a challenging spirit, you know, hey, what do you know? But I don't understand this. This doesn't make sense to me. Um, and in many ways, I think devotees are taught not to do that. Um, at least when I was a bhakta, I don't mean to criticize my bhakta leader who assuredly is listening to this right now. Um, but, uh, you know, it, this, is, this is just what it is, you know, and keep your challenging questions to yourself. But that is not a process of investigation. Um, the thing is that once we get a satisfactory answer, then we need to surrender. So on that point, I also just want to go back and say that although it is common to teach in public schools that this debate has been settled since the 1600s or the... the uh, the 16th century, rather, the 1500s. In fact, this debate has been settled in the fourth century before Christ. So the Greeks mm -hmm. had very elaborate methods of measuring surface area. Um, they had these people, I forgot exactly what they were called. Um, I'm going to look here one second. What were these people called? They were called um, Bematists, B E M A T I. STS, Bematists, and these people were mm -hmm. a type of engineer in the ancient Greek, Grecian empire, who were trained to pace out the size of land with their steps. Um, and they did land surveys all over Egypt, the Middle East, and the Near East of Asia, as far as the, the Greek empire um, spread at that time. And so one of these guys, Aristophanes, he took all that data and he was able to, using that data, he was, first of all, able to figure out that the earth is not flat. It's round. If you, if you pace out this many steps in Egypt, it's a different land area than if you pace out that same amount of steps in Norway. If I want to drive east to west across uh, North America, it'll take me much longer to drive from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco than it would take for me to drive from Vancouver, British Columbia to the East Coast of Canada because the earth isn't as far around in the North and anybody with a car can experience that directly. You don't need to take my word for it. Anyway, Aristophanes was using Pythagoras's hypothesis that the earth was round. So Pythagoras was able to intuit or use deductive reasoning, which is a pramana, anuman, um, to suspect that the earth was round based on a few things. Number one, wherever you go on the earth, if you look up at the sky, you see something a little bit different. And so if we were standing on a flat plane, looking up at a dome, we would see the same stars everywhere we go, just in a position, different position relative to each other. But Pythagoras was able to see that if I go north and south on the earth, the stars that I see change entirely. And if I were to go to the Southern Hemisphere, I would not see any of the stars that I see here in Florida. Same thing with the moon. Um, if I was on a flat plane and the moon was directly overhead, wherever I was on the flat plane, I would see the, the face of the moon that I'm looking at. But we don't observe that on Earth. Nobody observes that on Earth. On Earth, wherever we are, we are seeing the same face of the moon. And science, the scientific method can explain that, why that is, and it can also predict that. Um, and so we should not reject scientific knowledge when it fits the bill of the scientific method. Um, a third thing that Pythagoras observed, which is um, the most commonly cited evidence, is that he observed ships sailing over the horizon. They didn't just drop off, as you would expect if something fell off an edge they rolled down and the mast gradually descended over the horizon. And not only that, if he went up on a hill or if he stood on the top of a lighthouse and watched the ship go down, he would, it would take longer. 
he would be able to see more of the ship for a longer period of time because he's higher up. And so he can look further around the curve of the earth. Mm -hmm. And so Pythagoras hypothesized this in a couple hundred years later, using evidence from this Bematis, these, these Greek land surveyors, Aristophanes uh, was able to calculate their polar circumference of the earth. So going from North Pole to South Pole and back around to within 1.4% of what NASA measures it today with precision instruments floating in space. So, and, and, and so, and anybody can do what Aristophanes did. So another way you do this is he had three sticks that were at different latitudes. And so he knew the north-south distance between these sticks and they could measure the point of the day in which the sun was at its zenith. And so at the high point, these three sticks project shadows at different angles and at different lengths. Yeah, I know of this, uh, yeah. of this experiment. It was, yeah. mm -hmm. So the flat earthers, the flat earth cons uh, hypothesizers, they, first of all, they falsely represent Aristophanes' experiment. They only use two sticks and they show how it's possible to do this experiment with two sticks if the sun was not some huge nuclear reaction 150 million kilometers from us, but was like a spotlight just a few miles above the plane of the earth. You could get two sticks to do this, but as soon as you put the third stick in there, it doesn't work anymore from the flat earth perspective. The sun has to be at something that's at a distance far enough away so that its light is hitting the surface of the earth parallel to each other. That is the deductive reasoning conclusion that comes from mm -hmm. the evidence. So there's Pratyaksha and then there's Anuman. And what is Shabda other than accepting as authoritative descriptions of Pratyaksha and Anuman? When we hear, when we hear the Shabda of Srila Prabhupada explaining Krishna to us, that is authoritative Shabda because he is Pratyaksha Vargamam Dharmyam. He is experiencing Krishna directly with his own senses. And therefore he is able to communicate to us authoritatively with Shabda who Krishna is. And so Shabda does not ignore Pratyaksha and Anuman. Shabda is what makes Shabda authoritative is that it's backed by Pratyaksha and Anuman. Um, and so these are some of the evidence that Aristophanes used. And that was um, 2,400 years ago. And all of the scientific evidence that has arisen since then has confirmed that theory. Uh, so the next, the next big thing of science is brought into this, of course, is gravity. I'll, I'll let you talk a little bit more before I go on a rant about oh, that. It's very, it's very interesting yeah. because you <laughs> obviously you have all details. I wanted to ask in between whether you can uh, present one of the most prominent arguments, pro and con, and you did already uh, brought up so many arguments that are, I think, pretty clear. Well, also, these were just all the Forspeisen. The Forspeisen. Yeah, please <laughs> then, uh, go ahead and tell us a bit more about, I guess it would be interesting to hear from, from many to the what are, what are the, let's say, strongest arguments? Or perhaps you could start with, um, you said before, it's actually not flat earth theory, but hypothesis. Yeah, and theories have the evidence. And elaborate uh, what the difference is, plainly. Okay, so one. if you go out, like I live here in Florida, the beach is right over there. If I go stand on the beach and look out over the ocean, open ocean, it looks like the ocean is flat. Um, and so I can hypothesize that the earth is flat based on my observation. But then if I start to test that observation, it actually falls apart pretty quickly. Um, one way you can test this is, for example, the city of Chicago is on the western shores of Lake Michigan, which is a, a huge lake that you would not be able to see the other side of if there wasn't a huge city. So you can't see the other side of the lake, but you can see the skyscrapers in the city. And so you can go to the eastern shores of Lake Michigan, you can calculate the distance from the eastern shore to the city of Chicago, and then knowing the curvature of the earth, you can calculate how much of the lower parts of these buildings will be obscured by the curvature of the earth if I look at it with a telescope from across the water. And sure enough, you can go out with a laser and do this yourself. You can do this calculation, it adds up directly, it works. So the flat earth hypothesizers will see the flat earth and they'll hypothesize that the earth is flat, but their observations are not very skilled. 
Yeah, it's all yeah, about the documentary. They're, they try to yeah, make because they don't know anything yeah. about science, and so then the, so that's one thing. Um, and so it, flat Earth hypothesis. Okay, there's a there's a reason to hypothesize that the Earth is flat. If I go stand in the middle of the prairie in Mecklen Mecklenburg Vorpommern, there's a circular flat horizon. I'm not dismissing that, but I'm saying that if you're investigation of the matter ends there you've not confirmed a theory you've just asserted a hypothesis mm -hmm. so let's investigate this let's stand on the beach and watch the sunset <laughs> you know the sun is going from here to here um so the flat earth hypothesizers will say the sun is not actually setting they'll say it's receding into the horizon but Anybody with an inclinometer, something that measures the inclination, or a sextant is a tool that measures yeah. the inclination of the sun, can directly measure that the sun is setting. Well, yeah, that would be the sun argument. That was also something that came to my mind. I was wondering if the model, in my simple understanding, because I'm not so much of a scientist, if I would assume the Earth is flat and then there's a sun always going from, from, from east to west. Yeah. So, um, Usually with the with the with the globe model, of course it makes sense. There's like okay, there's turning of the planets, and with this rotation, this make is possible. But what happens um, in flat Earth? Where, where's the sun? What is it? Is it doing? Um, is it going underneath and showing up again? Or like what do you, what do they mean with retreating? Or like well, here's the other thing: if the Earth is a flat plane and the sun is above it, how come it's not daylight all the time everywhere on Earth, and then night all the time everywhere on Earth when the sun goes down? And the flat earth people will say it's because the sun is actually very small and it's very close to the earth. So it's not a giant burning globe that's sending its light rays parallel to us, illuminating the side that is hitting all at once. It's like a spotlight that's just shining on, you know, different parts of the earth at different times. And so, okay, that is an assertion that could support their hypothesis. In the scientific method, the next thing you need to do is build a model that shows exactly how that works. And that model can't contradict anything else that we perceive. So one thing that we perceive are lunar eclipses. And every time there's a lunar eclipse, you can see the shadow of the Earth on the moon. And every time since time immemorial, we see the shadow of the Earth on the moon, it is a circle. And so the only, and, and we know that the sun is, is a, a lunar eclipse, the moon, the sun, and the earth are not always in the same line. The sun strikes the earth, the sun's light strikes the earth from different angles and projects the shadow onto the moon from different angles. But every shadow is always a circle. So the only shape that you can shine a light on from any angle, and it will always perfect, project a circular shadow, is a sphere. That is the only shape that will do that. And we perceive every time there's a solar, a, a lunar eclipse, that's what we see. And so that's, again, direct evidence of the Earth being round. Um, a, not only round, but a three-dimensional round ball, not a circle. If, um, if I take a plate here, so my plate, I'm taking my, my plate here. If I take my plate, you know, I'll only get a circular shadow like this if I project the light here and the shadow comes up here. If I project the light here, I will not get a shadow anymore. Uh, circle anymore. Mm -hmm. I'll get a line or an oval. And nobody has ever seen a line or an oval shadow of the earth projected on the moon. Um, and so they can build this model with the spotlight sun and the close by moon. And that can explain why it's not always light or always dark on the surface of the earth, but it cannot explain lunar eclipses. It cannot explain the phases of the moon. It cannot explain the seasons. The round earth theory which is a theory because it's backed up by a lot of evidence, not only can explain all of those things, but it can predict them thousands of years out into the future. And so that's another element of the scientific method is that the scientific method, scientific knowledge has to be predictive. If you can't use your knowledge to make a prediction, it's a different kind of knowledge. And I'm not discounting other kinds of knowledge. I'm just saying it's not scientific knowledge if it's not predictive. Thank so, you. <laughs> yeah. So, in, in essence, um, would you would you say is what is there any um, actually? I guess you 
by your arguments, um, it's kind of obvious, but I would like to ask you again, is there any strong argument um, on the flat earther side for kind of proving or at least establishing that the earth could, earth could be flat? As there isn't because it's not, frankly. Um, and so the main one that then, that, so then there are two more that I'd like to just address here briefly. One is the issue of gravity. So uh, many flat earth hypothesizers will say, if the earth is round, why doesn't water just fall off of it? You know, that's the same as saying, how come people in Australia aren't falling off the earth? Um, and that that is just basic scientific ignorance. So there is no such thing as down in three dimensional space. Down is a social construct. That's a word that humans have invented. When we talk about down, what we're really talking about is the center of gravity of a system. And so let's just take the earth and one human. The earth weighs 10 to the 24 tons. It's huge. You, maybe not you, I weigh about a 10th of a ton, a hundred kilos, right? So the center of gravity in the Dr. Banks earth system is damn near the center of the earth. And so everything that comes into the earth's gravitational field is pulled towards the center of the earth. So if you are in Australia, you're being pulled to the center of the earth and it will feel like you're being pulled down. If you're in Brazil, standing on the, the side of the earth, you are being pulled towards the center of the earth and that'll feel like to you, you're being pulled down. And so it's the same thing with water. Mm -hmm. Gravity is the force of attraction of objects of mass. And there are a lot of things we don't know about gravity. Uh, we don't know what it is ontologically uh, we don't know where it came from. Um, we can't describe it substantially, but we can measure it and we can control it and we can use it to predict things. And if you don't believe me, you've never been on an airplane. You know, <laughs> flying through the sky, landing back down on the earth. We've, you know, so uh, same thing, satellites, spaceships, supposedly NASA just landed a rover on Mars, this, this all represents, so even if you don't believe they landed on the moon, you have to believe that there are satellites. Otherwise, how am I talking to you right now? Um, you know, there's a, a, a global link satellite up there that's beaming internet down to us. Um, Elon Musk, Jai, Elon Musky Jai, anyway. Um, <laughs> Okay. So this all is a result of humans mastering gravity, how to control gravity. And of course, this is also a yogic city, Lagima city. Um, we've done this through externalizing our technology, which I will agree is a demonic, you know, endeavor. It used to be that humans were able to transcend gravity through the power of their own yogic abilities. We've lost that power, but we have uh, manifested it externally. Um, the other thing, and so people who are claiming that, you know, the, why doesn't the water fall off the side or whatever, they just don't know how gravity works. And they will admit, they will say that gravity doesn't work. But gravity works, they just don't understand it um, because they're scientifically illiterate. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing with water is that they like to claim is this, this idea that water finds its level, which um, is uh, absurd. Uh, water doesn't find its level. If you put water into different containers made of different materials, you will see that the level of water changes based on the relationship between the adhesive forces of the, between the water and the container that it's in and the cohesive forces of the water itself. So if you put water into a glass measuring tube, it forms what's called a meniscus, which is like a little U at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And so scientists are taught when they measure something in a graduated cylinder, you measure at the bottom of the meniscus. It's called the meniscus, same thing that's in our knee. What happens is, is that the adhesion, adhesion is the property of connectivity between two different substances. The adhesion between the water and the glass is greater than the cohesion of the water molecules itself. Cohesion is the um, property of the substance that allows it to stick to itself. So water is cohesive. That's why we get surface tension. That's why water forms droplets um, and like that. That's cohesion, the surface tension. If the adhesion of the container is greater than the cohesion of the water, you get this upward pointing meniscus. The opposite is also true. If the adhesion of 
the container is less than the cohesion of the water, you get an, like an upside down U. And we see this in biological material all the time. Uh, this is what allows plant roots to transport water from the soil up to their leaves without any pumping action. This is called capillary action. The adhesive forces of the walls of the cells in the plant is less than the cohesion of the water. And that creates an upward pressure of the water allowing it to drive up the plant. So the idea that water finds its level is false. Um, water does not find its level. That is not a fundamental property of water. The fundamental property of water that these flat earthers are trying to get at is the property of cohesion. And because water is cohesion, it wraps itself very nicely around the earth. Um, and so again, mm -hmm. profound scientific ignorance leading to a completely false conclusion that will sound intelligent to somebody else who is completely scientifically illiterate. But hey, go do your own homework. I didn't make this <laughs> stuff up. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps we could um, just shortly, since we are with the earth topic, another, um, I say issue, if it's an issue, um, out there is like the age of the earth. That, for example, <laughs> okay. in some, uh, based on the Bible, many Christians claim earth is um, not more than 10,000 years old. Is that correct? Yeah. And then Six, the, 6, 6,000 years old. Six, and then the Vedic scriptures, um, Give a very different um, perspective on the existence of Earth, since we have a very uh, cyclic um, way of looking at it. That the Earth comes into existence, remains again, is reproduced, and has certain intervals of 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 uh, yeah, creation and, and and annihilation. So, could you could you shed some light also from the scientific field? What is their point of view um, in terms yeah. of how old is the Earth, and also Vedic uh, scriptures? Like, can you put these things a bit together for us? I can. And in fact, I, I have a talk that I've prepared and I've, I've given a few times called Does Modern Science Falsify Vedic Claims About the Age of the Universe? And the answer is that it does not falsify Vedic claims about the age of the universe, partly because Vedic claims about the age of the universe are not scientific claims. There's no way to test them. Um, and so the Vedas will claim that the entire, or the Bhagavatam states that the, the length of a, the life of Brahma is 155 trillion years. Um, and so we have no way of measuring anything that old. It's simply not a measurable thing. And so therefore it's beyond the purview of science to begin with. That is very different than the Christian claim, the, well, not all Christians, there's a faction of Christians mm -hmm. called young earth creationists who claim that the earth is only about 6,000 years old. And this is based on the work of uh, Bishop James Usher, who's the Archbishop, I think of Ireland back in the day, and using the genealogies in the Bible and historical records um, and archeology, span he calculated that the earth began on sometime in March, I think March 17th, I don't know, some, some day in March. And he gave actually a precise time in the evening in 4,004 BC. And so that's very recent. That's 6,000 years. That is actually within the realm of recorded history. And so that is a scientific claim. <clears throat> we have plenty of ways of measuring things that are 6,000 years old. And that claim can be debunked really out of hand. There's geological evidence. There's paleontological evidence. There's archaeological evidence. There's anthropological evidence. There's linguistic or philological evidence. All that are older than that time. And so that claim can be debunked scientifically. The claim that the earth is as old as the Vedas say, there's really no way to test that. So what, do we, what we do know is that we're like halfway through a day of Brahma right now. And so we can calculate that that is about 2.2 billion years uh, that we've seen through Brahma's day. Um, the whole day of Brahma is roughly equivalent to the believed age of the earth from the scientific perspective now which is about 4.5 billion years. So, but we've only been, so people, oh, so it lines up nicely. No, it doesn't, because we're only halfway through Brahma's day right now. So Brahma right now is only about 2.2 billion years old. Um, and we know, we know the earth is older than that. Um, we can date rocks, not in the Grihasa sense, date rocks, but date the age of the rocks. Um, 
using mass spectrometers and, and radioactive decay, which is something, I don't know if you want me to get into the details of, of all that right now. Uh, but I do have a, a whole presentation on this topic. It's on YouTube for those of you uh, that want to go uh, visit it. Yes, yeah, certainly interesting. We will, we will blend in a link for sure. Yeah, I'll send you a link. Um, I do want to circle back to the one other thing about the evidence of the flat Earth. So here's the thing with the evidence of the flat Earth. There are pictures of the Earth from space. Um, you know, and I, I believe that there are pictures of the Earth from space. So first of all, to get a picture of the whole Earth from space in one shot is very challenging because you need to get really far away from it mm -hmm. to do that. So up until just a few years ago, there were actually only three pictures from space of the whole Earth. Um, one was taken by um, an unmanned uh, Apollo mission that just went around the moon and came back. One was taken by an Apollo mission, the so-called Blue Marble, uh, the, really the most famous one. I forgot what the third one was. Um, but recently, uh, NASA lost, launched a scientific mission that had uh, started back in the Clinton administration, so back in the early 90s, so 20 years ago. Um, they wanted to launch this mission to study the Earth's magnetic field and space weather. Uh, we know that the sun shoots off a lot of radiation, coronal mass, ejection, uh, um, coronal mass ejections, things that can be very damaging to technology that we have in orbit around the Earth and also very damaging to life and technology on Earth itself. And so NASA wanted to send this probe to study space weather, basically. It got hung up in Congress for a long time. They finally launched it. And this thing is on a huge orbit around the Earth and the moon. So it's actually able to take pictures of the Earth and the moon transiting across the Earth in one shot. This is all pretty new. This was launched either in the Obama or the Trump administration. I can't quite remember, but, but recently. So now we have actually tens of thousands of pictures of the entire Earth from space that does not involve anybody believing that people landed or didn't land on the moon. Um, before that, we had a lot of composite pictures of the Earth, which means that there are satellites and they take pictures of certain sections of the Earth and then someone with a computer photoshops them together. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is something that the flat Earth hypothesis like to point out that all of these pictures of the round Earth are photoshopped. Yeah, most of them are photoshopped. Most of them are photoshopped. Yeah, and what that means that is that they take a picture of Germany and then they take a picture of France and then they sew it together until they have the whole thing there. Mm -hmm. And that is a completely scientifically valid thing to do. There's nothing nefarious yeah. about that. They so, get, the, the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, because they couldn't get the whole <laughs> image, only let's call it fragments or parts of it, which had to be yeah. put together like a puzzle yeah. that you have to complete like this. Yeah, so in order to really believe that the Earth is flat, you need to assert that every single one of those now tens of thousands of pictures, not only from NASA, the Chinese Space Agency has their own pictures, the Russian Space Agency has their own pictures, the European Space Agency has their own pictures, the Iranians have pictures of this stuff, the Indians have pictures of these stuffs, and many of these people, the Russians, the Chinese, and the Iranians, I, not the Uranians, uranium is something else, Iranians, <laughs> the Persians, yeah. They have every reason to want to embarrass the US government. If these guys had any evidence that NASA was pulling a hoax on us, I, I would think they would share it. Vladimir Putin loves embarrassing the United States of America. That's his favorite thing to do. But they don't have any evidence that this is a conspiracy. So in order to believe that the Earth is flat, you have to believe that not only is NASA lying to us, but all of these space agencies are lying to us. And then you also need, and you can't stop there if you want to be taken seriously. You need to propose the question that you ask, who is benefiting from this? You also need to propose, how exactly did they do this? How did they fake all of these photos? What technology did they use? And you can go on YouTube and you can see people who, for example, like, and YouTube is not the best kind of evidence, but for example, <laughs> the people that make these, um, uh, these graphic, the high-end graphics cards for computers, I forgot the name of the company, what is the, the graphics process, whatever they are. Um, they've done studies on old NASA photographs to detect where in the graphics process these could have been faked using known technology of the time. 
And frankly, it would have cost NASA more to fake the moon landings than it would have been to just go land on the moon. They just didn't have that kind of technology in the 1960s. So this is a gigantic leap of faith that people are mm -hmm. taking. We just want to outright debunk every one of these pictures. But to satisfy those people, we can provide plenty of evidence that the Earth is round without appealing to any pictures. You know, Aristophanes was able to do this 2,000 years ago with no technology. And his experiment is repeatable. You can do it yourself, given enough time. And um, you need a little bit of expertise, a little bit of training in how to do it. But this, you know, you could train a seventh grader how to do that experiment. So. And then, and then here's the other thing with conspiracies is that the, you know, I, I point out, well, where's the evidence that there's this conspiracy? And then the conspiracy theorists use the lack of evidence as evidence of a cover up. And that is not science, that is not scientific arguing. You, that's fine. Um, but that's where the science in this discussion ends. Yeah. Yeah. Go, go, does it go in this direction like an, a non falsifiable uh, kind of point? It's not a point. Like this. Exactly. And that is actually the whole crux of the scientific method. The scientific method doesn't prove anything. Um, and any good scientist will tell you that. Science is not about proof. Science is about plausible explanations. Um, and so first of all, if you're making a claim that can't be falsified, it's not a scientific claim. Second of all, if you can't, if, if, if a hypothesis has been in circulation long enough without anybody ever falsifying it, it gets elevated gradually to the platform mm -hmm. of the theory, which is why I say the flat earth people don't have a theory, they have a hypothesis, which is falsifiable and has been falsified repeatedly. The round earth people have a theory which has not been falsified and with which there are many divergent lines of evidence that support the same conclusion. Yeah. So divergent lines of evidence means it's not all arguing along the same line. It's arguing from different perspectives. So I've presented gravity, I've presented eclipses, I've presented seasons, I've presented how we view the stars yeah. and the moon and the sky, I've presented how things recede over the horizon. And I could frankly go on. Yeah, thank you. I think it was already <laughs> a very rich and very informative um, exchange with you. Thank you very much. For yes, I, await, I eagerly await all of your angry emails. <laughs>